Good afternoon, class. We're going to continue our exploration of Razor Pages in HTML by adding searching and filtering to our previous movie project site. So this is the site as we left it from the last lesson, where we are displaying all of the movies in our movie database, and we're applying some CSS styles to make them look pretty. So the first thing we want to do is we want to add a search form to this page. So that means we're going to add an HTML form element. And inside of that, we're going to put in some inputs. So the first input I'm going to put in is of type text. This is going to be our search box. And we'll give it a name of search terms. And then we'll also have an input of type submit. And this creates the button that we will actually click to run the search. We'll go ahead and give that a value of search. That's the text that will appear on the button. And this is one of the interesting things about HTML is almost all of the inputs we would be using in a form are actually an element named input. And we tell what kind of input it is from the type attributes. So we have text and we have submit. There's also number and date and a whole host of those that you can look up on MDN online. I'm also going to change our title from movies to movie results to show that this is actually a search result. Now, when we run this and click that get button, what we're actually doing is making a request against our server. And I'm going to actually turn on developer tools in my Edge instance, or if you're using Chrome, uh, it has those turned on by default. Uh, actually, the developer tools are the same between Chrome and Edge because Edge is actually now built on top of the Chromium browser. So in the developer tools, one of the handy tools we have is the network tab, which shows us what resources this web page is actually requested. So if I add, go ahead and put in some kind of search term that we want to search for, like word love, and click search. Notice that it tells us that it just made a request, and we can see the URL has uh, this search terms equals love appended to it. So this is a git request which takes any values from our form, serializes those in a what we call URL uh, form encoding, and slaps it into the URL up above. You can see it here as well. So this is sending a request to our server. Our server is receiving that request. And right now our response is, because the actual page we're going to is the index page, and we know that because there is no uh, path supplied here before this query string, uh, we're just going to return the page that, they, that we clicked on. Also notice that this name search terms was used as the key in that URL. So that's actually what it matches up with. Now, the first thing we might want to do is go ahead and keep that persist this term so it will show up in our search box in the results. And in order to do this, we're going to jump into our backend code for this page, which is a page model. So if we expand the index.cshtml, notice we have this backend code, and this is just what our current default is. This method, the public void on git, is actually invoked every time we make a git request against this page. And it gives us a chance to do any kind of initialization work uh, that we need to do to make that uh, do what we want. And this would be a good place to potentially get those terms. So the first thing we're going to do is actually declare a variable of type string to hold the terms that we're going to get from that web page. And we can get those from the request object. Now if you remember from our discussion of HTTP, the request that comes in is nothing more than a stream of data. And that data contains a lot of key value pairs in the header. It possibly contains a body. Uh, and it contains the information about the URL that we're making that request with. Now, .NET actually parses all of that data and turns it into this request object. So if you look through here, you'll notice we have properties to, for example, access the path. We can access the method if it's a git request, a post request. We can determine if it's uh, secure. Uh, we can read the raw headers 
or we can actually pull out the header information that's been parsed out into particular keys. If there was a body, like if it was a post request or a put request, that body would be here as well. Um, and in this case, this is a git request, which means that all of the form data was appended as part of that query string. And we can access the raw query string from here, but we also have this query object, which we can access like a dictionary, and it has all of the key value pairs already parsed out for us and made available uh, exactly the same way we would access them from a dictionary. So we can, for example, access the uh, search terms by that search terms key. And this key is actually determined by what name we applied to our input. So this is the input. This search term says that that's going to be the key in this request we get here. Now in order to make this terms value available back here, we need to create a public property within our page model. And that will also be a string, and I'm going to name it search terms to match what the key parameter is. We'll do our get and our set. And we'll just use the auto uh, property format here, so it creates for us a private backing variable that uh, is handled automatically. And now, in the index, we can actually access that value. So we could set the value of this input to be at model dot search terms, where that is the property that we just defined in that model. So this will come back and assign whatever that value is. It will concatenate it into the string for the value that's being supplied to this form. Now the last thing we need to do in here is we need to take and set our search terms property equal to the terms that we just parsed out. And of course uh, we could simplify this a little bit by just setting those terms. Now, you might be wondering what's going to happen the first time we run this, because we won't have an incoming request object with this term. So this actually will evaluate to null, setting the search terms to null, which means right here this value would be null, so this will actually concatenate in an empty string, and the end result is we will just display the form empty. The first time we actually submit the form, we will have added our own value. That will get parsed out in this line and assigned to this property, which means when we render this page, that property will now be concatenated in as the value. And we'll see that actually show up in our form. So let's go ahead and see that in action. So now, in our search term, in our text box, and go ahead and run the search. Not only do we see that showing up here as a parameter, but we also see it appearing uh, in the text box when we come back in. So that value is being persistent. Now the next thing we want to do is we actually want to make the search functional. So we're going to jump back to our movie database now. And we will add a new method and this is going to have to be a static method. And it's going to return a list of, or a collection of movies. So we'll use the I name over again. We'll call this method search, and we'll take as an argument the terms as a string. So this is going to perform our search for us. Okay, so the first thing we're going to do inside our method is create a list of movies to hold our results. And the next thing we're going to do is we're going to do our null check. So it is very possible that those incoming search terms will be null. The question is, what does it mean when those terms are null? And there's really two different ways we can think about this. We can think uh, if it's null, that means we're not actually doing a search, and therefore we want to return all the possible movies in the database. The other way of thinking about it is that if it's null, that means we are searching for something that has absolutely no matches in the database, therefore we should return an empty uh, collection of movies. And if we're doing the latter, we could just return this results. If we're doing the former, we could uh, return this all property. 
And I'm going to argue in this case that what we want to do is return all of those. Because what it means is that if that value coming in is null, that means there's nothing set as a value here. So maybe there was a search value and they deleted it and then they hit search again. And for that particular use case, the expectation is you would show all the possible results. Or the first time we come to this page, remember we said this value would be null, and we are currently showing all the results, so we might want to do that again. So, if we get past that null check, then we want to go through the database and look at all the movies and determine which ones actually match this search. And so if we're looking at each movie in the database, we can iterate through that list and we'll just use the all again. So we'll look at every movie in our database and we're looking at each individual movie in turn and we want to know does this string appear within probably the movie title, although we could potentially add directors and other kinds of information as well. For now we're going to start with the title. So movie.title. Dot. And remember, title is a string, so we can look in it for substrings with the contains method. So it contains terms, and we're going to actually use a string comparison value here as well. And I'm going to use invariant culture ignore case. What that does is that means it's going to compare these two strings, ignoring the current culture. So if you're an English speaker or a French speaker or uh, whatever the case may be, and it's also going to ignore cases. So if they capitalize the word under uh, lowercase or use a mixture of capitals and lowercases, it will just match. If there is a match, that means we want to add this particular movie to our results. And we could potentially uh, see if there are other matches as well. So we could, like I said, maybe look for a director's name or something like that. Another thing we could do is because this terms is potentially more than one word, right now we're looking for that exact substring. We could make this a little more useful by splitting on spaces and checking for does it contain one of these terms or another of these terms uh, or both those terms. And we could replace our list with more of a priority queue where we organize that based on how many of the terms were actually found in the search results. So there is a whole science of making searches more useful that you can dig into for this. Uh, but for right now, we're just going to do uh, the simple thing and just return that list. And with that, we now have implemented search functionality in our database. So we're going to get some search terms. We're going to see if that's a substring within the movie's title. If it is, we're going to add it to this results list, and we're going to serve those results back. Now we need to jump to our index page, and what we're going to do in here is we are going to go ahead and apply that search. But before we do that, we need to have collection of movies that we can save those results into. And I'm just going to call this movies. And then down in here, we can go ahead and run our search and assign that to that property that we just created. So we can say movies equals movie database dot. Remember, this is a static class, so we just invoke the static method directly on it. And we're going to pass in our search terms. So now the result of performing this search will be assigned to this property. And, and in our front end code, we want to replace this movie database dot all call with model dot movies, so that property that we just defined. So now whatever we've loaded up in that list, that's what we're going to display on this results page. You can see that in action. We can repeat our search for the term love. And we get an unexpected result here. An unhandled exception occurred while processing this request. And that is a null reference exception. Somewhere an object reference is not set to an instance of the object. 
If we look at the actual line that's showing up, this is when we're checking to see if that title contains. So let's go take a look at our code there and see if we can't get to the bottom of that. So if we jump back to our movie database, the problem line is this one right here. So if we think about what we know about these different terms, we know this movie exists because it's being pulled out of this list and we haven't had any trouble iterating over them in the past. So it's definitely not null. We also know that our terms was existing because we saw that search term being repropagated. So we know that that value exists as well. Uh, the one value that we don't know for sure exists is this movie.title. So is it possible that one of our movies does not have a title? And we can actually go in and dig through uh, that movie database underlying data, this movies.json data, and we look through here, if we look long enough, we will find that one of our titles indeed is null, and that's this film right here. Now if we actually dig through and look at these other metadata uh, attributes, we'll find out that this actually does have a title. The proper title is unknown, a film that was released in 2006 on this particular date. And you might be wondering, well, what went wrong? And the answer is whoever parsed this database, turned it into a JSON file, uh, probably was using a couple uh, default conversions. So when it saw this word unknown, it interpreted that to be uh, that there was no title for this movie, or the title was not known, and it replaced it with null. This is not uh, the only problem in this database. Uh, if we dig around a little bit, for example, the movie Birth of a Nation is listed in here as being produced in February 8, 2015 as a release date. And if you are a bit of a history buff or a cinema buff, you'll know that this was a landmark film because it was one of the first 12 reelers ever released. So it was the first true feature-length film, and that was actually released in 1915. So definitely this date is wrong. It's also a very controversial film because it dealt with the reconstruction and the birth and growth of the Ku Klux Klan, but clearly that date's wrong. And then actually if we dig through uh, all of the movies in here, we'll figure out that actually quite a few films have the wrong date, and most likely what was going on is rather than storing the date as four digits, it was being stored as only two digits in the original database. So when this conversion uh, was run, whoever the programmer was just assumed if it was below a certain value, it's a new movie that was released in the 21st century. And if it was greater than that value, uh, it was released in the 20th century. So they probably just added 2000 or 1900 to that value to keep the final value. And that worked well enough for the vast majority of films in here, but basically every film that was produced before 1928 is mislabeled as having been uh, released in the 20th century. So there are a lot of problems in this data. And unfortunately that is very, very common uh, sort of problem that we run into with databases is that whoever did data entry sometimes just put in junk values as a placeholder uh, so they could submit it or uh, other things like that. So you will see this kind of problem pretty often in the working world. Uh, what we probably need to do, we can go back and clean up that data like we renamed the title back to unknown and that's a good good change. But we also want to make sure that this doesn't crash in the future if somebody adds another movie and does something silly like that. So one of the things we can do is we can add a null check into this if statement with a boolean and. This, if there is no title, if the title is set to null, will evaluate to false. C Sharp uses lazy evaluation for uh, boolean and. So if it, kn it knows that if this is false and whatever's on the other side doesn't matter because the false and anything is always going to be false. So we'll never actually try seeing if the title contains that term if there is no title over here which prevents that particular null exception from occurring. So this little bit of safety helps keep us from that kind of crash error. So now if we repeat our search, we'll notice that our results now all contain the word love. Uh, you might be wondering about Cloverfield, but it does indeed contain the substring love. 